So welcome everyone. Happy uh, afternoon or morning, depending on which coast you're on. Um, I'm Andrew Snyder from Cope Health Solutions. I'm the Chief Medical Officer. And uh, for those of you who have been re uh, recurring with us at these sem seminars or webinars, we've been uh, trying to keep up to date with timely information throughout the COVID crisis on waivers and use of uh, new, new technologies and things that you can do during this crisis. And today we're continuing that, trying to answer questions that come up with our clients around the country. And this one I'm referring to uh, reducing your out-of-network leakage uh, to bring back some of that uh, volume lost uh, over this time period. So we're here uh, to talk about to mitigate the financial impact of COVID-19 by reducing your out-of-network leakage. I've worked on both coasts, uh, deep in population health management. I was the chief medical officer for Brown and Tolan Physicians in the Bay Area, and then was the EVP and chief clinical integration officer for Mount Sinai Health System in New York City. Um, but I'm the, of least importance here because I brought with me three uh, leading experts in their areas uh, who know a lot about this uh, this topic from different perspectives. And I think we'll find it interesting. They come from very different systems uh, and represent a, a lot of what's happening around the country. Uh, so to my stage left, I have Dr. Mina Bonsell. Uh, Mina has been at Mount Sinai since 2001. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with her as a colleague um, and is currently the Vice President of Population Health and Quality and Efficiency. She's the, also the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for Mount Sinai Health Partners, the population health platform for Mount Sinai Health System. She also serves as Director of Quality Assurance for New York Medical Partners, ACO, and works closely with the entire Mount Sinai Health Partners team to develop novel strategies to improve the quality and efficiency of healthcare provided to her patients. Her focus has been on building a population health infrastructure that will allow a large urban academic health system to be successful in value-based care. Next to her, you see uh, John Beeman. John is the Chief Business Officer for Adventist Health in California. In this role, John has direct executive leadership in operational management of information technology, analytics, human resources, supply chain, construction management, facilities, and other business services. Prior to this, this new role, he was Senior Finance Officer for the system shared services since January of 2011. And finally, and not least, we have Bill Sesney. Bill is the Associate Vice President for Network and Business Development at Montefiore Health System. Prior to this current role at Montefiore, he served as Senior Director of Provider Services for Montefiore's care management company, which works with a network of more than 3,400 physicians and ancillary providers who provide care to more than 225,000 individuals covered by a variety of private sector and government sponsored health insurance programs. Bill has also ser served as Vice President of Network Development for Affinity Health Plan, where he was responsible for contracting, credentialing, provider relations, network development, and business process improvement. So all of them have played a large stake in, uh, in managing top line revenues, uh, even in value-based uh, environments and, and the hybrids we live in. Um, so I welcome them all and thank them for being here. Um, let's go to the next slide. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the talk. Uh, we're going to try and leave about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end to answer your questions. Uh, if you have any, please enter them in the, in the chat or send them uh, into, at info at copehealthsolutions.com. We do monitor this throughout the talk and we'll um, ask for presenters at the end uh, of the presentation. If we don't get to your question or to the Q&A, we do send out the questions with answers after this, along with the link to this recording, as well as the PDF of the slides, um, as well as a survey we appreciate you to fill out. So all that is coming um, afterwards. Next slide, please. So today on the agenda, we're going to talk about just to give, I'm going to give a quick overview of auto network leakage and what we're talking about as a topic. And then we're going to talk about it from three different perspectives from three different systems. So we're going to uh, speak about leveraging data and analytics to reduce out-of-network leakage from Bill. We're going to talk about clinical programs that you can implement to reduce leakage from Dr. Bansal and how COVID-19 affects the network operations recently and how this plays into the leakage issues uh, by John Beeman. And then we'll get to question and answers. So next slide, please. I will be out of the way and after this slide, I promise you. Uh, that, um, so, you know, referrals play a big role in the profitability and growth of health 
care organizations. We all know that. And even um, those that take some institutional risk, uh, it tends to be either a minor component uh, or it's still paid on a fee for service chassis. So in that circumstance, um, th there a lot of, th there's a lot of hedge betting going on that it's still um, better to bring in the volume currently than to, you know, the burden hand is better than two in the bush than, than, than potentially um, change, uh, wait, wait for it in downstream in the back end. And that's just the, the, the size of the, the business right now that any institution is taking risk. So I would just keep that out in the back of your head as we think about um, why we're talking about fee for service in this, in this environment, because it's still here and, and it's mostly here for all, all the hospitals. Um, but not only do you lose that top line revenue, you lose the, those, those patients perhaps for future care. And, and this is the, this is the, you know, this is long-term business. Uh, recent reports uh, from Becker's hospital review show that leakage costs over half of the U.S. Or, organizations at least 10% of their annual revenue. And I think that's probably conservative. So obviously reducing leakage can help your organization become and stay more profitable. So in that vein, there are three kind of areas of that, ca that cause leakage. There's the proximity or convenience, right, to patients, the access issue. There's the provider reputation uh, and then patient education about the services that you can provide well with high quality and good outcomes. And there's the provider awareness is a big problem of knowing who, who is your network and how do you access them best uh, in a whole provider education piece. So we'll hope to talk about those three areas and how they sort of merge together uh, across these different um, systems and how they're approaching leakage. So on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill Sesney to talk about how leveraging data and analytics to re can help to reduce your out-of-network leakage. So thank you, Bill. Good day, everyone. Bill Sesney from the Monitor Medical Center. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about Monitor here, what it means, what out of network means, because uh, we used to have a vice president at Montefiore who would who said uh, where you can't where you stand on a subject depends on where you sit. So across Montefiore's network, Montefiore's health system, out of network means different things to different people. On this slide, you've got a picture on the right hand side of uh, uh, the Bronx, Montefiore in the Bronx and the Hudson Valley. Montefiore is in Bron the Bronx County. Westchester County, Rockland, and Orange counties. Uh, and it represents a number of different provider groups across that system. We have 11 hospitals, this, uh, six, over 6,000 providers uh, wrapped up in two IPAs, one in the Hudson Valley, one in the Bronx, 3,000 beds. We have skilled, we have uh, 150 skilled nursing beds. Uh, we have clinical affiliates, not only the hospitals, the 11 hospitals that are formally part of the Montefiore Health System, but we have our clinical affiliates, three hospitals, uh, St. Barnabas, St. John's, and St. Joseph's, uh, two very large provider groups. And for the past 20 some odd years, Montefiore has been pursuing um, uh, an aggressive strategy in value-based contracting. From full risk contracting, where Montefiore has, where Montefiore will own uh, responsibility for the premium, to our participation in uh, uh, CMMI's Next Generation ACL, which we were doing for eight years, and uh, we have a significant strategy in shared risk or shared savings contracts, which I'm going to reference a little bit as we talk about um, uh, the data strategy. So, next slide, if you would. When we're making data-driven decisions, you sort of, I mean, it's all about understanding your population, not only your provider population, but also your patient population. Uh, and so, so it depends, so that begs the question, where are you getting your data from? Uh, it, it, this is all, for me, this is all about the most effective data, the most, uh, the clearest data is through our, our value-based contracts. There are services out that the health systems can contract with that do subscription services where they aggregate uh, claims data across an area. That can be very effective, but it is um, it, it does not give you the patient level specificity uh, on those insights. Um, the if you have the correct tools, 
you can leverage your shared savings contracts in order to provide you the insights, the very good insights into your into your network. You know, it, there's a shared opinion in the New York, at least in my part of the New York area, that shared savings contracts benefit health plans more than a provider system. That it's very hard for provider systems to earn the incentives uh, that are promised by those shared savings contracts, and the health plans get the benefits. But if you can, the health plans get the benefits of the providers chasing quality data. But if you can leverage the claims data that comes with those value-based contracts, uh, we have seen that those, the incentives in those insights are, are significant. These, it's depending on how those data feeds work with the health plans, you're getting real-time visibility into your network referral pattern, you want to make sure that there are, that data is refreshed on a timely basis. And if you have the correct tools, you can tar target service lines and services. So depending on your system, your health system, the strengths of your health system, you can, you can drive specific programs, target specific populations of physicians, providers, and their patients in order to highlight and feed your uh, your uh, high-end services. I wanted to use a, a specific example that we've been playing with at Montefiore recently. This is not about this topic in particular. It's, M M Montefiore has a very fine uh, uh, bariatric surgical program. So I've been working with them to, ha to see how we can get them, bring more patients to those services. Um, I use this example. Uh, I use this as an example because it's it's very clean. When I'm looking at or trying to find the patients that over time might be valuable to our um, bariatric surgical program, I can look for a single diagnosis if I'm looking at bariatrics. Mor morbid obesity. Morbid obesity has a single ICD-10 code, and so it's very clean, I can, I can identify the patients who have that diagnosis and begin to think about what we can do for those patients. I was looking at, um, uh, we have two uh, risk-based contracts, whole risk contracts, uh, or level three value-based contracts in, in the Bronx. One is with Health First and one is with uh, a health plan called Emma. Uh, that represents about 250,000 lives at any given time. And when I look at that data, when I go searching for the morbid obesity diagnosis, we find a cohort of 5,100 patients that in a 12-month period have been diagnosed with that, with that specific diagnosis. That doesn't mean that 5,100 patients by any means will need bariatric surgery, and it doesn't mean that they're gonna need it right now. But it lets me know, it lets us know which doctors those patients are panel to. Who do I have to make sure that when the time comes, those physicians have an easy pathway to refer those patients into the system? And it's not a single referral either. A patient must be, for, for bariatric surgery, a patient has to be evaluated, a patient has to be counseled. It's a process that might go on for as long as a year. Uh, and that relationship still stays with the primary care provider. So you wanna make sure that there's a, an effective, not only referral process, but an effective feedback process between the surgeons and the uh, uh, PCP who's managing that patient over time. The other thing about this is that if you're in a competitive market, you want to be able to mitigate those competing interests. You want to be able to know who your population is that might be seeking care someplace else. I've got 5,100 patients in this cohort. I want to do something to make sure that in an appropriate fashion, they know what Montefiore's programs are not that they're going to a neighboring health system looking for those services. Um, and, as I, and as I talked before, I wanna make sure that when I'm giving them information, in a way, by the way, that's not insulting because uh, it, it's, it's a sensitive topic, but to that, 
when the time comes, either the PCP can make the referral, or when the patient picks up the phone and wants to learn more about Montefiore's programs, they can uh, do that without being put on hold, without being transferred, with, without having a, uh, an unpleasant uh, uh, experience. So as I said, the, 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 so the, the challenge is for us to the 5,100 patients. And then the solutions are, um, how do, so then how do I, uh, we had this fascinating conversation at Montefiore when I arranged the conversation with the director of our bariatrics program and our, uh, one of our medical directors in our primary care network. Uh, the, the, the bariatric surgeon was surprised to hear how challenging it was for the PCP to make the referral and not as much make the referral as it was to keep that provider informed throughout the process. I have found over the years that one of the most compelling thing, things about using analytics, this type of analytics, is the conversation it allows me with the providers. It lets me sit down and have a conversation with providers and invariably we discover things that are broken within our process that can be corrected to fix it over time. It's not so much, oh, did you know we have a bariatrics program? It's, oh, did you know how hard it is to refer to a bariatrics program? Do you know how challenging it is for the patients to uh, 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 use those services over time? So the, 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 the first, it's the relationship with the plan that gives you the data. It's the tool that lets you access that data. Who are your, your, uh, your most, uh, uh, the, the programs that you want to drive, who are the patients that might avail themselves of those programs and the providers that own, you'd like to think own those patients, and then how do you serve that uh, over time as we go forward? Um, so that, so bariatric surgery, 5,100 patients, it's actually a fairly small cohort, but it's a fine program at Montefiore, and it's only one of any number of programs that if you have the opportunity to think about the data and how you would, uh, what insights that data provides, um, you, it, for us, it has given us some great opportunities at keeping business in network. That was my presentation. I would turn it over. Great, thanks, Bill. Um, so next slide. So first of all, how is Mount Sinai positioned for value among a crowded and competitive market? We have a top 20 ranked medical school and large academic medical center with six surrounding community hospitals, allowing for us to expand our footprint. We have more than 300 community care locations throughout the New York City metro area, more than 6,000 physicians with approximately 2,500 that are employed faculty like myself. And we have other clinical affiliations with specialty groups that further expand our geographic reach. But more importantly, we deliver value. When you compare our cost relative to our academic medical center peers, we, like my colleague Bill from Montefiore, come at lower cost, position our, positioning ourselves to be the partners of choice for both payers and employers. But there, next slide, please. But there are very unique features to Manhattan market that are important to understand in order to design and implement effective solutions to address out-of-network leakage. First, as mentioned, we have an unusually competitive market uh, with several world-renowned health systems within blocks of each other. In fact, on a single street, you will see groups affiliated with Sinai, NYU, Cornell, Columbia, and of course, we have renowned world specialty hospitals like HSS and Sloan Kettering all in walking distance. This compact geography makes it difficult to constrain patients to a single system as patients can switch so easily from one uh, provider to another. Moreover, benefit design by payers does not disincentivize or inhibit such patient behavior. So in examining our claims data, we saw that while many patients may come to Mount Sinai docs for their primary care, some of the higher cost specialty care was going out of network. Leakage was particularly hard to manage in the outer boroughs where we may have PCPs in our clinically integrated network, 
but fewer specialists, ancillary services such as physical therapy, ambulatory surgical centers, radiology, and uh, capital assets like hospitals. And of course, systems just like Sinai have no control where an ambulance may take a patient when 911 is called. So what are some of the clinical strategies we have employed to combat leakage? First, as Bill kind of mentioned, or I think Andy mentioned in the beginning, it's critical to define your network carefully, but more importantly, communicate your network composition to physicians. From a practical perspective, outside of our hospital-based doctors, our PCPs within the clinically integrated network do not have a firm understanding of which specialists are actually in the Mount Sinai CIN. They simply think about whether the specialist across the street takes their patient's insurance or not. They're not thinking about who's in our CIN. Therefore, educating physicians on who is in and who is not and sharing their out of network referral patterns transparently is critical uh, part of that discussion. And I will share at the end a dashboard that we've used to track that. Furthermore, we try to create connections between local specialists that are in the CIN that those PCPs may, may not be aware of. We suggest docs who are high value and importantly have good access. Access is critical. If a specialist has a three month wait time, we're not gonna really make that recommendation to a PCP for obvious reasons. It's such an important driver of both provider and patient satisfaction. Finally, where we may have many PCPs, but a lack of needed specialty care, we've had our specialists go and spend one day per week in the PCP's office. So we can bring appropriate specialty care to them. We do this, for example, in transplant hepatology, where our physicians go out once a week at different sites across Long Island. This helps so that patients don't waste their time coming into Manhattan when they can get that care more locally. And we also created strategic partnerships with specialty groups as an, another strategy where we may need a broader footprint. And then there's education and outreach on the patient level. Since we have a broad footprint, a patient seeing their PCP in Staten Island or Long Island, for example, may have no idea that their doctor is part of the Mount Sinai CIN. And this, they don't feel really part of a Mount Sinai family. This becomes particularly important when we try to do centralized outreach um, care management, for example, or a quality team, and we're calling a patient from a 212 area code. Naturally, the patients have no idea that their physician is associated with Mount Sinai, so they wonder, who are you and you know, why are you calling me? So what we've done is really try to do some branding in doctor's offices um, so that they start to feel like they're part of that Mount Sinai family and slowly develop brand loyalty. In addition, um, we proactively outreach to patients likely in need of care using predictive risk scores. And then if they call us, then we have them flagged in our call center so that we know that they are high risk of utilization and that they need to be seen within 24 hours, whether that be by video or in, patient, uh, in person. And so really by providing timely appropriate access and promoting brand loyalty, we try to avert leakage. So what are some novel clinical solutions we've implemented? I'm gonna focus on two. One is e-consults and the second is community paramedicine. First, in terms of e-consults, Dr. Tamler at Mount Sinai has developed an e-consult system to connect Mount Sinai CIN to over 25 specialties. This program serves multiple purposes. First, PCPs can get quick input about a case without inconveniencing the patient to go for a face-to-face -face visit. 70% of e-consults are returned within 24 hours. Often, there's really a great amount of education that's actually happening here as well for the PCP. When they might initially refer a patient, say for TF, uh, abnormal thyroid function tests, and they get that e-consult, the workup for that is kind of outlined for them. And so over time, there's less likelihood that they'll actually even need to consult the endocrinologist in that example, because they're actually being educated to manage those problems themselves. 
Overall, we avert about 61% of inpatient visits using e-consults, and so that obviously decreases overall specialty utilization as well as the total cost of care. And then if an in-person visit is needed, now the PCP is likely to send it to that same specialist. And so now we're fostering relationships between providers. Now, what have we done um, where we don't have hospital assets? It, community paramedicine is a critical strategy. What we do there is if a provider um, if a patient reaches out to a provider for something that normally they would say, hey, go to the ED, something like, you know, mild shortness of breath in a patient with CHF or dehydration, what the provider can do is connect with our community paramedicine team. Then a paramedic is dispatched to the patient's home and a video visit is done with a Mount Sinai ED physician and the PCP can actually loop into that call as well, should they want to. That allows for on-scene uh, uh, evaluation and potentially treatment. They can give IV fluids, they can give IV Lasix, they can give IV steroids. And about 70% of ED visits are actually diverted with this program. And so what, and during COVID in particular, this was instrumental. 75% of ED visits were averted by the use of community paramedicine. If the patient does need to be transported to the hospital, they've been a little bit stabilized and then they can actually be directed to a Mount Sinai ED, again, limiting that out of network leakage. So this really allows for course correction and ED diversion strategy and enhanced patient uh, care coordination. Next slide. And then as I mentioned, this is the type of dashboard we've created to track our out-of-network referrals. And this, is, this data is shared transparently with providers. Initially, we looked at all out-of-network referrals, but we realized that we're not going to interrupt established patient specialist relationships. If a patient's been seeing a cardiologist for five years, we're not gonna say, sorry, they're not in our CIN, you need to switch. So what we did is we um, altered our dashboard to be able to track only new patient visits. So we monitor the types of patients that are staying within our CIN, either with our employed or voluntary doctors, or those that are going out. And again, sharing that information with providers and providing them with alternate referral options, uh, we hope to continue to improve our out-of-network leakage. With that, I'm going to pass it on to John to talk about how COVID-19 affects network operations. Thank you. Before I begin, I'd like to first welcome everybody to the west coast of our great nation here. And uh, Adventist Health, I want to give you a little perspective of, of who we are. Uh, I think I give good context so as I talk about uh, barriers and network definition. You know the frame from which uh, I'm coming from. So you see the maps uh, here in front of us. What they don't necessarily show you, unless you're just very intimately familiar with uh, California, is that this, our footprint not just covers a lot of territory, uh, but where we uh, serve is very diverse. Uh, so we have hospitals in the middle of Los Angeles, uh, in fact, East LA. Uh, we have hospitals and clinics where we're the only provider, and could be the only provider for miles around, uh, many rural uh, markets as well. And on top of that, if you think about the type of care and the type of populations we serve, 80% of our patients, of our members, so to speak, are governmentally reimbursed. So they're either Medicare or Medicaid. And, and that creates a very unique dynamic for us. So when we think about a network, when we think about uh, who is our community or who are our communities, we're looking both in urban and rural, and we're looking largely in, in people who probably have uh, other comorbidities and other situations that they need to deal with, again, either Medicaid or a senior population. Uh, and the last thing I'd call out is you can, as it relates to COVID, you can expect when we service this type of geography, uh, that the peaks, the valleys, the roller coaster of COVID uh, looks wildly different uh, based on that community. You know, some counties in California, 
uh, were very minimally impacted. Others have had a sustained impact that have gone on for months. And so you, as we operate at a system level, how we think of our network and how we manage that network looks uh, differently and has looked uh, dramatically differently based on the impact of COVID. Let's go to our next slide. So the first thing that we did uh, as, as we thought about how, how does COVID affect our network ops really started with how do we define our network? Uh, historically, we would have answered that question that each community uh, has a network uh, and the capacity for that community was focused uh, on the members that were unique to that, that town, that city, or, or those zip codes, you know, in the big urban areas. What COVID caused us to do was, first of all, just start from scratch and say, our network is actually the entire state of California or you know, smaller components if you get to Oregon and, and Hawaii and Washington. So instead of thinking of our network and our capacity and how we looked at data and the, the offerings we provided one community at a time, <clears throat> we took a step back and said, if we don't look at this across the entire state, we're not gonna be able to service our communities and service our populations. And just like many of you, when we think about the capacity, then we said, okay, how, did that, how does that increase our ability to serve. The first, the first wave of COVID, you know, we depressed volume and had plenty of capacity. But as we opened, reopened and then got hit with the second wave of COVID around the state, we really started to feel these capacity constraints. And so like what we've already talked about this morning, we went to, to the barriers to creating capacity. And so you think about technology, you think about people, you think about supply chain, you think about access, you think about the analytics and the insights. And so we programmatically went through each of those and made sure that we had the ability to uh, connect to our patients no matter where they were. Uh, we had the supplies when needed and we had the people trained and ready to serve. And so like many of you, we went the telemedicine route before COVID. Uh, we had 5% of our volume was, was delivered in a virtual fashion. Uh, that peaked, you know, from an ambulatory setting as high as 80 percent, you know, during the first peak, and now it's stabilized around 40 to 50 percent. But what we've done, again, as we thought about capacity and, and defining that network, is, is we expanded that thought beyond the traditional ambulatory environment and said, we, we need to uh, examine every area, every way we deliver care um, for our patients. Uh, in a virtual fashion? How can we expand the hospital setting into the home? How can we look at other types of care that maybe perhaps weren't considered as a part of our network? Think behavioral and, and go and, and include them as a part of our network and increase our capacity and the services we're delivering there. And so what we, what the first thing we did is we reset the definition of our network, thought about the barriers we needed, um, it, we, was we set up a system command center. And we have uh, developed real-time data platforms um, that we can now see every patient across our entire system real-time in one spot. So this accelerated our delivery there. Um, the clinical offerings also were accelerated. So that's what give you a, a, a couple of examples here as we go through this. But the first thing we did, um, you know, we're a faith-based company out here and we believe in the whole person care. And so when we redefined our network, we, we started to ask ourselves, what other areas are important during COVID that we should be offering during this time? One that immediately came to mind was on behavioral. Uh, think of, if you go back to the 80% being governmental and, and about 50 to 60% of that being Medicare, you know, there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of loneliness, there's a lot of anxiety um, that we knew was present in our, our network that historically we, sure, we had, you know, behavioral options, but it wasn't the focus. Well, we shifted that and made that a focus and brought on board a virtual behavioral health platform so that we could connect uh, to uh, our, our associates or our members in our communities uh, could connect uh, to a counselor virtually, uh, powered and supported by artificial intelligence that could actually help monitor and, and stay in touch uh, with our members and the people inside of our network. Uh, even if they couldn't physically come see us, we could connect with them virtually. Uh, and specifically, I'm referring to around the areas of, of behavioral health, anxiety, stress, loneliness, 
um, and often you know, deeper um, and other more serious issues. Uh, the second thing we did was we partnered with some community-based organizations uh, to help address the health disparities. Again, having a high Medicaid population, um, we obviously saw that uh, present itself in some of the peaks uh, of COVID, uh, but we also knew we had to do more uh, than, than just uh, wait for our members to come see us. So again, redefine our network and redefine our offerings. Some things we did is we partnered with food delivery uh, organizations. We've, we've delivered hundreds of meals uh, to people in our communities, again, hoping to make sure they not only have the food they need, have a well-balanced uh, well meal and diet, but really help them as far as, as far as their health journey, knowing that many of these people could be seniors, could be Medicaid, maybe hesitant to come seek care during this time. And so thinking again of how do we uh, manage the health of our population and, and of our network uh, during this time. Um, and it's amazing how we've, some of these organizations we've partnered with, some aren't necessarily community-based organizations. We've had uh, companies donate food to us um, that we've then also been in turn uh, able to, uh, to share uh, across our, our company. The last thing I want to call in this slide is that intra-network fluidity. Um, as I noted earlier, part of what we did is redefine our network as the whole state. And, and during COVID, because of the technology infrastructure we were able to set up, uh, because of the analytics we were set up, and because we had the ability to uh, make sure supplies were where they had to be at the right time across the entire state, uh, we've gone as far as transferring patients 600 miles. And as you think about that in the past, you know, both family members, providers, and even the patients themselves may have questioned that. But when you're in the peak of a COVID crisis, um, you know, we felt it was a part of our duty to our network to manage not just each community, each hospital, but, but share the resources and make sure each member, each person got the care they needed. And so based on where the peaks were happening, you know, we were able to see through the real-time analytics where we had a capacity, uh, uh, where we had capacity in another hospital or another city and actually move uh, patients around uh, across the state and make sure that every member, every person within our network uh, was able to stay within the network, but also able to receive the care they needed at the right time. Let's go to the next slide. So I've, I've probably hinted at already and, and touched on most of these strategies, but I'm gonna start with that telehealth and technology and, and go uh, clockwise around the, uh, you know, the diagram here. So telehealth and technology touched on this, you know, being, uh, a footprint in many rural areas. I'll, I'll put a plug in here for the need to get, you know, 5G and, and a common infrastructure across all parts of the United States because this became, this is a very important part of being able to develop and deploy telehealth and uh, technology across the, the footprint. Um, as we go then to the innovative pilot programs, um, some of these are based off of that telehealth, but I'm gonna give you a couple here. So you, I mentioned the behavioral, we had a virtual based behavioral platform. The other thing it is we, we started to center our thought of, can the home be the hub for health? And uh, you know, I, as I've met people and talked with them, a lot of people do believe that their strongest sense of healing happens in their home. And so we've extended the acute care setting uh, into a hospital at home environment. And so we actually can, uh, have been providing acute care services uh, in the hospital and in the home setting. So in addition to the, the wrapper for behavioral, uh, we've been able to extend, create capacity and deliver higher level of care outside of the four walls of the hospital, which has been very important as certain communities have been at capacity, maxed out, uh, et cetera. Uh, the other innovative pilot program has been with our seniors. Again, if you combine the thinking of the home as the hub, many seniors uh, throughout this year uh, have been hesitant to seek all the care they've needed. So connecting with them, uh, deploying that virtual behavioral health, uh, connecting them maybe on food and other social determinants, et cetera, uh, bringing those together and target them to a specific population within our network has enabled us to uh, maintain that health focus and, and help them through it. Uh, tracking patient uh, pool through the data. I think many of uh, us this morning have hinted on the importance of data. Again, I just call out that system view. So being able to look at every location, real time, 
um, understanding where our, our patients were and, and where there's an opportunity to, to move them and, and maximize the full system capacity to provide the care. That's probably the number one strategy I'd, I'd call out there. Communication, obviously this doesn't happen uh, by an executive or business development or an analyst or an operator just simply declaring it. Uh, communicating, uh, we've sent mailings directly to our people in our network. Um, we've worked closely with our physician providers, both those who are highly aligned and, and others, and families. Um, you know, the communication important during COVID and, and other times of what we've learned of, of maintaining that network integrity, uh, it's caused us to, to evaluate all stakeholders that go into selection and patient flow. So family members, the patients themselves, medical staff, uh, et cetera, uh, having a complete and communication strategy uh, across that has been important. Touched on the social determinants of health already, you know, food, um, others. Again, we've, we're based in Sacramento, so we had the ability to work with the governor and others on some of these programs and making sure we partnered, uh, even in some areas uh, where we historically didn't, to make sure that, uh, again, expanding our network and all the communities in California had the care they needed. And then ending on, on payer alignment. Uh, obviously, all this sounds great. It, it's very mission oriented. It serves our, our communities. Uh, but if the business model isn't there, you know, obviously over time it, it falls apart. And, and the reason I wanted to end here is, is you know, during the crisis, some of the, uh, the, the payer models, the reimbursement, both from Medicare and, and other providers have been present. Um, during this time and what I think is an important strategy to continue going forward is to learn from all of these programs, but also learn that maintaining uh, the ability to have a, a proper financial model that's, that, that surrounds this, this care model is just as important and uh, making sure that that continues, whether that's directly with specific payers, the government, or uh, the communities we serve. And I'll hand this uh, back now to uh, to Andy, I believe. We'll take it. Thank you. Thank you all. That was that was great. Uh, really interesting. So, so, so what are some of the summaries here? And, and, and I'm not going to read the slides. You have you have this already, or we'll have it coming. But in general, you know, we started by talking about data and analytics, and and using it to target solutions and having targeted opportunities. Really narrow, narrowly focusing on the program you want to feed. And, and, and which patients and how that patient, how that patient journey gets them there. Uh, we talked about programs having, you know, geographic specificity and, and regional reach um, and using data proactively uh, to use, um, to, to understand the programs, your access, your capacity before those referrals are needed. And, um, and <clears throat> excuse me, Bill used bariatrics as an example for this uh, uh, process. You know, clinically, we talked about, you know, nothing happens clinically as far as leakage goes without knowing your ne network. So Mina talked about knowing the network from both the patient and the provider perspective. On the patient engagement side, you have to have, you know, think even things you do well, like centralized approaches can actually affect leakage in, the, in, the, in your outer regions and the brand and the brand knowledge and retention. So, so patient education and engagement really does matter. Uh, there is a lot of patient choice especially in, in high competitive markets. Uh, on, the, on the provider side, many providers just don't know who is in their network and what network means to you versus each plan or, 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 or insurance uh, company that has their own networks. So, so defining network and making it meaningful to the providers uh, is, is, act, is key as well. Uh, and, and then actively linking your providers to local high value specialists, especially as you move out into your periphery away from your, you know, quote, mothership. Um, on the clinical end, a couple examples, you know, e-consults, you know, getting those curbsides between professionals that, that have gone away when, when, when PCPs don't go into the hospitals as much, um, it, it really changes the flow again, uh, allowing the sort of interaction and learning uh, on a constant basis. Um, and, and, and similarly, uh, John talked about telehealth in the same vein at Adventist and, and trying to get virtual all care as much and, and reaching out to the homes as much as possible to the patients. Talked about paramedicine, um, decreasing ED di uh, directly, right, with avoidance, but on brand. They know who's out there to help them. Um, and uh, 
finally, clinically, John talked about uh, on the clinical end, the, uh, you know, making sure you start bringing in community-based organizations, behavioral health, and start thinking through the social determinants, helping, helping their lives in other ways than, quote, straight medical um, actually helps all around. Um, and I think we all, we all understand that. Uh, we talk about being proactive. Uh, you know, she, uh, Mina talked about going after those new patients, not disrupting the established patients. You have much let her, less yield in that. Another example of that is um, I had worked on a program where we were looking at people who are aging in, not to Medicare, as that term is usually used, but aging into age 50. Who is about to need a colonoscopy? Where do they live? Are they commercial? Do we have resources in those neighborhoods? catching someone on their first colonoscopy means they will most likely do the rest of them with you as well if they haven't moved. And you're picking up those early disease patients and keeping them in house. Just another way of looking at proactive use of data and finding the right populations for the right, you know, end services. And uh, finally, John uh, talked about sort of the, knowing the network definitions again and the barriers to that, um, how, uh, system leakage um, changes uh, by definition with geography and especially with COVID because of the change in coverage. The patterns have just changed drastically and acutely. And it's hard to keep up with that. Um, and capacity changes over geographies and needs, especially because of the, the changes in coverage and access. So there has to be a multi-pronged approach to uh, uh, take care of patients and keep them on brand in network uh, without the leakage. Um, taking care of the home um, is certainly a patient retention program if they know who's serving them. Home as the hub is a concept. Um, bringing those wraparound social determinants, behavioral health, all the way up through acute care um, can really keep obviously patients um, attached to you and sticky. Um, so as a summary, I'm gonna end there. We do have some time for a couple Q and A's here. Um, so we had a couple sent in that are, that are, that are great. So, um, John, I'm actually going to start with you and ask you, um, what, what other innovation, uh, during this time, um, you know, especially in the acute phase of this COVID crisis, have you felt may, has made the biggest difference in reducing network leakage? Honestly, it gets to using the, uh, the home as a part of the network, um, and to me, that, that's a transformational thought. I mean, it kind of sounds easy and we've kind of maybe thought of it, but for, for so long, we've thought of, you know, network being the care. And if we think of the home as, a, as I said, one person, their, their words, the home as a spot of healing, maybe more practically a, a spot of care, a part of the network. To me, that's been the one transformational thought that both I think makes sense today is, and, and expands the capacity, the access of the network and one that I think there's huge opportunity to keep thinking of how do we build on that thought as we go forward. That's, that's great. And, and before I go to any, any other questions, do any of the other panelists have comments on that question? Do you want to add in or? And I think that's, I think that's exactly right. I mean, if you look at community paramedicine, you, you're going to the home delivering the care and then that same patient could be linked to a visiting doctor's program or what have you. So, so that, that longitudinal care that can be delivered at home, I think is transformational. I agree. That's great. Thank you. Next question, this is an interesting one for um, all three of you are both all at large hospital systems. So how prevalent do you find is institutional risk through capitation, ACOs or bundles, uh, either in your, you know, either throughout the nation or basically within your systems that you know of, but, and because therefore, you know, how relevant then is the network leakage issue to you? How do those two issues play off each other? John, any thoughts? Yeah, so California, you know, it's been prevalent out here for what, almost 20, 30 years now. Um, how it looks and, and who has some of the financial accountability for, for different parts of the at risk is, is what's nuanced based on the town you're in, the payer you're working in, a work payer you're working with rather, um, et cetera. Uh, I would suggest even if you don't have a capitated uh, contract or an at risk and institutional at risk, at least in California, I, we did the math here a while ago. I mean, it's, 
60% or more of all of our income has some sort of at-risk component to it. It may not be full institutional risk. It may not be global risk. But, but more and more, our structures out here are, are assuming both a network integrity, but also a certain quality of care, a certain service, all of which goes into, uh, I love how the other panel mem members mentioned it in their talk, you know, keeping an, an engaged member inside of the network. So from my perspective, it's very prevalent. Uh, it is a financial model that does help in this case of wanting to keep people in network and it's very uh, pervasive out here. That's great. And, John, and, you know, yeah, Bill, I want to get your thoughts. Uh, sorry to talk over you, Andy. John, no. I find fascinating uh, listening to people from the West Coast talk about uh, managing risk contracts. In, in, on the East Coast, what we, in, in order to do a risk contract effectively, not only does the network, the provider network, have to be able to uh, manage risk, but you have to find a partner plan who can manage risk as well. There's an awful lot that goes into a, a contract in which your network takes full, full risk on a pop population, the analytics, the data transfer, uh, the, the ability to manage an authorization process. And we found over the years that uh, not every plan can do it. And if they can't do it, y your network ends up um, uh, you could you could expose yourself to a lot of losses just because of poorly managed a poorly managed relationship. We we have had some very successful long term relationships uh, in New York, but man, we've also had some real clunkers that have been challenging to our system. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna. I'm going to actually push a little bit further on this topic because I think it's actually very interesting. Um, if the John, in your experience, because you're moving towards risk, and, and Bill as well, and 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 Mina, the, you know, as I started this this, this conversation today, I said the you know institutional risk, even through dual risk programs and others, is still mostly on fee for service chassis, and therefore you have to hedge your bet. And do you, do you want that top line um, and, and keep the and, and and have that volume occur? Or is it better to let it sort of, you know, try and go for the savings, right? And, and, and most institutions have still relied on the former. In your experience, in your, in your growth move towards value, do you feel there's some threshold level or where is it where, where, the, where the actual system says, oh, maybe the incentives are now different and, and actually change that perspective completely? Have, have you seen that happen anywhere? And where, where do you think that line might be? Yeah, this, this I'll, I'll kick off. I mean, the line, I mean, I, you can do a mathematical line, et cetera. Like I said, I, I think, I don't know if it's, once you get above 50, if it's 40, if it's 60, it's somewhere in that range. But, but what I would suggest, um, you know, when you think about all the areas of health and, and all the investments that many of us are putting into improving um, the cost of health, making it more affordable, et cetera. The, the model of having a, a risk arrangement and having that top dollar is definitely one where the incentives become more aligned. Now, what I would suggest where that one falls apart is, I think there's also a ton of administrative waste uh, in, in all of our models, right? You got, you know, the payers got a process, a, a revenue cycle team, quote unquote, the hospital's got a revenue cycle team. You got all these other administrative waste that are in the system and, and the capitation agreement may not incentivize as much of, hey, how do we work together to get those costs out, at least not directly. So I do think beyond the institutional risk, but other models, it's imperative that we continue to find ways that incentivize us to remove all this waste that's in the system and, and be able to pass on uh, the affordability or the lower cost to the member. That's, that's great. Any other, Bill, any other thoughts on that? Mina, thoughts? Well, I mean, I guess, um, you know, obviously we are on a fee for service kind of infrastructure. So I think right now, assuming that the utilization is necessary, I mean, we'd rather pay ourselves, especially if we're cheaper than than others in our market. So I think from uh, for our standpoint, that's kind of where we're at right now. And I think that the partnership with the payers is critical because the benefit design 
in New York does not promote in-network utilization. When somebody can just go to HSS without any kind of referral or anything, they just can just walk in the door. Um, it's very hard to control that. So the benefit design also has to be different for us to be able to be successful in this current market. You know, uh, the one thing about the pandemic is that when so much business left the systems, when so many people were afraid in New York to to come into the system for services, and the only people coming in in, in the city were COVID patients, um, you, you saw quickly the benefit of having uh, these full risk relationships. If if the money was there in your system up front, uh, you sort of guarded against this incredible challenge to the health system. Um, I mean, I'm with John. I think there were grand opportunities over time to uh, chase efficiencies and remove the administrative costs in the system. But I go back to what I said before, you really need to believe you have a dependable relationship with the payers in order to, whether it's the government, uh, a relationship directly with the government or whether it's with a health plan, uh, you need to be able to depend on that relationship going forward and have a comfort that you have a partner that's not going to roll up the bridges when the times get tough. Thank you. And thank you all. That's great. And, and I appreciate everyone's time today out of their busy schedule. We're, we're on time. Um, so I do want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're going to send a the copy of this presentation out as well as the link to the, this video. Uh, so you'll have the webinar as well as a Q&A and a survey. So please fill out the survey. We're happy to talk to any of you out there about these issues any further. You can email us as you see at info at um, Thank you all, stay safe. And our thoughts are with those in the uh, Gulf area having a really hard time. Have a good day, everyone.